it's nice having a job when your only involvement is when things go bad. Um, it's better now. I used to work for the CRA, or I was their lawyer for 10 years, so uh, uh, I'd like to say I'm wearing the white hat now. Um, all businesses uh, face legal and regulatory hurdles, uh, legal and regulatory uh, bodies. Perhaps there are there's no greater uh, body or body with greater power than the Canada Revenue Agency. Um, to put things into perspective, where uh, Jeff was talking about transfer pricing, and we're going to talk a little bit about CanTrade. Uh, they are going to face an audit, uh, notwithstanding the excellent work of the BDO. Um, but uh, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, that's probably the biggest transfer pricing case uh, out there right now, certainly in Canadian history. Um, just to put things into perspective, Canada, the CRA determined that the price of inputs for a particular drug was not according to fair market value, and the fight was over about a billion dollars. So can trades face with an audit? Um, the first question is, uh, what happens first? And usually there'll be a request for information from the Canada Revenue Agency. Uh, sometimes it's an informal request and sometimes it's a formal request. And uh, the clever little monkeys at the CRA sometimes try to cloak an informal request into a formal requirement. That distinction is crucial because um, an informal request, and that's usually how audits start, uh, the CRA will ask for information, they'll often ask for a lot of information, sometimes they'll ask for information from third parties which can get a little dicey when you're dealing with customers and, 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 and clients and, and perhaps lenders. Uh, but a request for information will list out a bunch of things that they'll want you to provide. A requirement for information will do the same thing, except if you don't comply with the requirement, you, you could well, theoretically go to jail. So there, there's, a, there's, a, there's an important distinction between the two. Um, and oftentimes it's, it's not easy to pick out. So the, the, first, the first thing you want to look at when you're facing an audit is, is yes, what they're asking for is important, but also how they're asking for it, uh, because that can affect your, your business. Uh, now, the, the, the next question I'm often asked in the, in the course of an audit, and, and uh, can trade ask me that, by the way, can trade uh, authorize the release of solicitor and client privilege information here, so I, I can talk about uh, our relationship with can trade. Um, the, 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 um, the, the question is um, often with respect to documentation, um, third parties, uh, third parties you'll, you'll re be required to provide documentation, but they'll often go to third parties. And um, third party requests for information can be a little tricky. As I mentioned earlier, um, they may get the information directly from you. But if they don't necessarily think that they're getting enough information, they will go to third party suppliers, customers, etc. cetera. Um, it's important to manage that process early on. Um, you want to avoid generally getting requests for information, uh, requirements for information from third parties because it can be incredibly onerous. The costs of complying with requirements for information requests can be significant. Um, how broad are the CRA's powers when they're asking for this? Uh, when we're dealing with government agencies, uh, we often see on TV, et cetera, um, I have my rights. This is the government. Uh, this is a democracy. Uh, I've seen it on TV. I, I'm, I have my rights, and uh, you can't make me uh, provide that information. Um, don't, doesn't the Charter of Rights apply to me? Um, and and the, the sad answer is with respect to the Canada Revenue Agency, uh, no, uh, the Charter doesn't apply to you. Um, in fact, you have greater rights when, uh, when the police come knocking at your door than when the Canada Revenue Agency does. The reason being is we have what's called a self-reporting taxation system. Uh, there's generally two types of systems we can have. The government comes in and goes into your business, grabs your documents, and then tells you what taxes you owe. And they do that every year. And that would be overly intrusive on a yearly basis. Or you report your own taxes. And on good faith, the government will issue an assessment and say thank you very much and you could go away for two, three years. Uh, but they have the right to audit. And um, notwithstanding the excellent advice of BDO, you are audited, and, and why is that? And it's, it's, the answer is it's because it's a self-reporting system. Uh, you could be completely compliant, you could have the best record-keeping system in the world, uh, you could even hire Jeff Garland as your, your tax advisor, and even still you could be facing an audit. And that's just because that's just the nature of the system. And increasingly, audits are uh, more a function of project files uh, rather than spot audits. 
uh, and perhaps even more than the, uh, the, the, the rat line, and that, that does exist in the CRA. And as Jeff mentioned, the projects are increasingly focusing on international issues. There's an entire division within the CRA, uh, the International Division, and within that division, there's a, a specific uh, division dealing with uh, transfer pricing. Um, unfortunately, if you are engaging in international business, you probably are more susceptible to an audit simply because uh, entities that deal internationally uh, can and sometimes do engage in more aggressive tax planning. There's nothing wrong with aggressive tax planning, but when you do that, um, you usually uh, come under the scrutiny of the Canada Revenue Agency a little bit more. So uh, our company's been audited and there's been requests for information. Um, we've been hired to uh, facilitate that process and we've been giving them as much information as we can while not giving them too much. You want to be truthful, but uh, if there's a particular issue you think the CRA is looking at, you want to manage that process uh, carefully. Because as we'll see, this thing's going to go all the way to the Tax Court of Canada. It's a self-reporting system, so when you do get to the Tax Court of Canada, you have the burden of demolishing the minister's assumptions. Where do the minister's assumptions underlying the reassessment come from? They come from the taxpayer. Um, the, the right against self-incrimination does not apply. Uh, in, the, in the tax world. So managing the process early on is crucial. So what we're doing with CanTrade is we're giving them uh, the, the advice and information to comply with the request for information, but also uh, maintaining their rights to, to, to keep those documents from the CRA that the CRA isn't necessarily asking for. They're entitled to everything they ask for, but they're not entitled to one document more. And sometimes it's that one document that makes all the difference in the world. So um, the CRA has completed its requests for information. They've analyzed the uh, transfer pricing issue, and they've made a determination that there, in fact, is uh, an improper transfer pricing. The inputs are not put in uh, at fair market value, and you're shifting revenue to a low-tax jurisdiction. So says the CRA. So you'll get what's called a proposal letter. And a proposal letter is not a, not a happy document to receive. It's a very detailed uh, description of exactly why the CRA is going to reassess you. Um, there's been excellent tax planning up to this point. Um, the nation's best advisors have been telling this company exactly how to plan. <coughs> Contemporaneous documentation has been maintained, and yet a proposal letter, letter has been issued. Why is this? Uh, the answer is simple. Uh, the CRA can and often is wrong, can be and often will be wrong. Um, why is that? Aren't they the, the body that administers taxation in this country? Uh, yes, they are, um, but they're just one of two sides. It's you and the CRA. The CRA will take an interpretation of the Act, and you will take an interpretation of the Act. Uh, particularly in issues such a complex as the uh, transfer pricing, sometimes there are no easy answers. Sometimes the way they've been interpreting it all along has been an error. Indeed, uh, not dealing with transfer pricing, but I have a couple of cases dealing with uh, scientific research and experimental development tax credits. It's a long word, but when you do research and development, you're allowed pretty good tax credits. Well, the definition of what is SRNED has been put in an information circular. It's been published by the CRA. It's been used for seven, ten years. Um, accountants have been using it across the land. And in a couple of my files, I had occasion to actually go in and let's look at the history of this information circular. What is the legislative foundation for this information circular? And lo and behold, I've discovered that uh, the legislation changed many years ago, but the information circular didn't. What does that mean? In this country today, in my opinion, the CRA has been doing it wrong for about 10 years. And everybody's been applying it a certain way, and uh, this issue may or may not get to the tax court, but um, that's an example of a historical quirk in the CRA's interpretation. The legislation changed, the CRA's interpretation didn't. Um, so that's uh, a particular area where it uh, can be a source of, of conflict. The CRA says you're wrong and we're saying no you're not. So they've issued the proposal letter. Uh, whether to respond to a proposal letter depends on your, your, your tactics and whether you think it'll do any good. In, in this case, we, we knew their position we knew their legal position, we knew it was wrong, and we didn't want to play our hands, so we didn't re respond to the proposal letter whatsoever. We re then received a notice of reassessment. A notice of reassessment 
Uh, that's the formal document that you have to respond to. You have 90 days to object to a, a reassessment. Um, you should get the reassessment, with, uh, the notice of objection within 90 days if you're going to dispute what the CRA is saying. Uh, that's not a lot of time. Um, if you're dealing with a complex issue such as transfer pricing, you, you have three months. By the time you get your, your, your accountants and your lawyers together, that's three weeks later. But it's very tight timelines. Um, you do have an additional one year to apply for an extension of time. They're usually granted, but the best course of action is to get your objection in within uh, 90 days. So we're at the appeals process. We've objected. The next body is to the Canada Revenue Agency Appeals Division. Um, what do you do there? Well, what you do before the Appeals Division is dependent on what has happened at the audit stage, what facts they've uncovered to date, and what your strategy is going forward. There's a little uh, funny little provision in the Income Tax Act that allows you to actually essentially bypass the Appeals Division. Uh, it's, a, it's a function of the uh, CRA bureaucratic um, quagmire and the timing provision of the Income Tax Act. If, if 90 days expire after you object to a notice of reassessment, you have the right to go right to the tax court. Um, it's almost a certainty that a CRA uh, appeals officer will not even be assigned within the 90 days. So you uh, de facto have a, have a, have a, you could have as a strategy bypassing the appeal stage altogether. Why would you do that? Well, that decision is not to be made lightly. But in our case, with Cantrade, we've made the determination that there are certain errors that we believe occurred at the audit stage by the CRA. We believe that the assumptions that the CRA has made against us, there's a couple of glaring errors, and we're going to bypass the appeal stage. Because if we bypass the appeal stage, um, those assumptions essentially become uh, frozen. And the CRA, the justice lawyer at the tax court is going to deal with that, has, is basically dealing with bad assumptions. Uh, that's one of the reasons why you'd bypass the appeal stage. Another reason might be you have a billion dollars on the line and you don't want to wait two years for a CRA appeals officer to deal with it. Uh, so there's pragmatic, there's legal, and there's strategic reasons why you would bypass the appeal stage. In this case, we did do that for Cantrade. So we're now at the Tax Court of Canada. Um, a couple of things about the Tax Court of Canada. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a court, there's a judge. Um, we wear robes, we don't wear wigs anymore. Uh, counsel, that is, the, the, the witnesses and the taxpayers don't have to wear robes. Uh, maybe they did in 1870, but no longer. Um, it's a court of law, it, but it's a specialized court, and it's a court that only deals with taxation matters. So the tax judge, or the tax court judge is an expert. Uh, so you don't have to go through the, the beginning. So you don't have to explain basic taxation principles to a tax court judge. And with an inexperienced tax litigation counsel, the judge will often be uh, putting, uh, putting the counsel to the test. Um, and secondly, it's a, it's a specialized court, but it's also a very efficient court. So one of the reasons why when we're thinking ahead, do we bypass to the appeal stage? Uh, we're thinking ahead to cost and the implications. Do I want to wait two years at the appeal stage or do I want to go right to the tax court? And when I say efficient court, when we think of litigation, and, and many of you are, are business folk here who probably have some experience in dealing with litigation, you, we, you, think, you think this could be six, eight, ten years before we're done here. Well, the tax court is, is, is extremely efficient. They'll bring uh, a file onto case management within three months of filing pre pleadings. Uh, I tell my clients, when they say, how long will it be? Is it going to be years? It's, I say, it might be a year and a half. And if, you, if you're on the ball and you want to get it done quickly, it could be done in seven months. That's how fast the tax court process uh, goes through. Um, so now we're at the tax court, and, and we've managed the process throughout. In our case, obviously, we, we argued our case brilliantly, and we were successful with tax court, and we saved can trade, what was it, uh, half a billion dollars, I think we saved for. Um, but that's, that's just a, 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 those are some of the issues in a nutshell that you'll face uh, when you're dealing with uh, the audit and appeals process, um, and and really, even though you're dealing with something as complex as uh, transfer pricing and international tax dispute resolution, the issues that you'll face in, in this case are, are very similar, whether it's a, a mom pop operation or, or a complex tax dispute uh, between multinational corporations and Her Majesty the Queen.